Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Unmade Halloween sequels. Let me start this episode by asking you a question. Does the idea of a straight-to-video Halloween movie scare you? Timing is also context, too. This would be the mid-90s when this was happening, and straight-to-video movies were not necessarily these low-budget things anymore. A lot of people were making straight-to-video movies because of the success of the rental stores, and it was an easy way to get your films out there on an even playing field competing with the big studios. But when you have a movie that is known for theatrical, going to straight to video could also give a pretty bad perception. Well, this almost happened with the Halloween franchise with the next Halloween 7 that was going to come out right after the Halloween 6 Curse of Michael Myers film happened. It ended up not happening, but it was this close. Today we're going to talk about what that movie is, the name of it, and the story. So buckle up. This is Halloween two faces of evil. So for the preliminary things about this film, it's important to note what happened after the release of Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Now, the film has obviously garnered a big fan base now, and it's a cult hit in the Halloween market for sure, but at the time, the perception was so bad, even the Fangoria reviewers and readers felt like they couldn't defend this film. Here's what one Fangoria reviewer said after the release of Halloween 6. One reviewer said that the only thing scarier than what Halloween 6 was is what Halloween 7 could possibly be. There's no doubt during this time that Halloween 6 disrupted not only the franchise, but the fan base itself. And now people were wondering, well, what the hell is going to happen with Halloween at this point? Fans at the time had no clue. Where would that story have gone? Would it have continued? Would they have restarted things? Nobody knew. It was completely up in the air. Well, the Weinsteins had quite an idea. Now, Mustafa was a little bit begrudging to accept this, but he ultimately did. Mustafa went through so much turmoil with the Weinsteins with Halloween 6, I feel that his guard was let down a little bit, and he was kind of dead on the inside, to be frank with you. Halloween 6, there was multiple litigations, there were threats of lawsuits, there was fighting. The Weinsteins filmed a new ending for Halloween 6 without even telling Mustafa. Mustafa was this close to suing, but because of the advice he got, he thought it would be horrible for the release of the film, so he decided to not do it. After this film came out, Mustafa Mustafa was probably so deflated, weakened, probably wished he never made the Miramax deal, quite frankly. So when the Weinsteins decided, hey, we're having success with the Children of the Corn series straight to video in terms of sales, you know what, let's just do the same with Halloween. As crazy as it sounds, Mustafa, he agreed to it. So to review, Dimension had the Hellraiser and the Children of the Corn series going straight to video. Mustafa begrudgingly had to go along with that decision to make the next Halloween film be a straight to video movie as well. Dimension exec Richard Potter soon met with Robert Zappia to see about penning a script. Being a big fan, he jumped at the opportunity. He was given one major instruction go in a new direction. Suffice to say, not only did Mustafa probably feel like the ending of Halloween 6 was just the end of this story, but also Miramax were like, okay, you know what? There is nowhere to go from here. We have got to start fresh. We have got to go in a new direction. Let's go back to basics as it were. So Robert Zappi was brought along to pen a treatment for what he was going to make. This film would be titled Halloween Two Faces of Evil. So what you guys are about to hear is the story for what would have been the first ever straight-to-video Halloween film. It's October 28th, 1998. Deborah Wiley is babysitting her younger brother and some of his friends while all the parents are out for the night. While the kids are downstairs playing around, Deborah takes a phone call upstairs. She's killed off screen, not showing who the killer was. Police arrive and new character Detective Richard Kincaid is assigned to this case. He immediately suspects Myers to be the killer. He expresses that another babysitter had just been murdered in a town nearby. Richard's partner scoffs at the idea. They decide to personally verify Michael's incarceration to rule him out as a suspect. Sure enough, they find Michael stowed away in prison, not saying a word, living in solitary confinement. Not long after the visit, Michael collapses in prison. Prison physician approaches Myers slowly and alertly. After finding no pulse, the shape is pronounced dead. His body is transferred to an off-site morgue. The shape returns to life, killing two hospital attendants. The shape steals a hearse, drives to a nearby drugstore where he notices a garish Halloween display with a mannequin donning a replica of his famous mask and coveralls. 
from the faithful night in 1978. The shape suits up with the mannequin's outfit. The shape enters the drugstore, killing the unsuspecting employee Eddie and his girlfriend Sherry, who was just there hanging out with him during the late hours. Sherry's body is found at the drugstore for the police to find. Eddie's body is missing. Shape continues his hunt. He begins to stalk the nearby all-girls school academy in town. He sets his sights on Joanne Washington and Linda King as they prepare for the school's annual Halloween dance. In the midst of all this, police find what they think is a suspect in these murders, a criminal turned magician named Kane Gabriel, obsessed with all things Michael Myers. Gabriel has a poor history with law enforcement. He also performed a magic act at the babysitter's little brother's house earlier that year, giving him a direct link to the victims. Interestingly enough, they find that Gabriel was already in police custody while the drugstore murders had just happened. Without any hard evidence, Gabriel was released on bond. Detective Richard Kincaid convinced Gabriel to stick around though, under the guise of helping them solve the murders and potentially meeting his idol, Michael Myers. We go back to the kids at the school, where we see Joanne being asked to the dance by Frank Roth, a student at the neighboring boys' school academy. Little did they know the shape is now stalking them. They narrowly escape him while still being unaware. Halloween is now upon us. The shape continues haunting the school, murdering one of Joanne's friends in the gymnasium pool before zeroing in on his main target. That night, Detective Kincaid and Gabriel are led into a swampy marsh area where they find the hearse submerged in water that the shape used as a getaway vehicle. They also discover the bodies of the missing morgue attendants in that trunk. On a tip from Gabriel, Detective Kincaid heads back to the school to track the slasher down. The dance is in full swing. The shape murders Linda and her date in the school kitchen. The shape sneaks into Joanne's dorm, slashing her in the thigh while she escapes to the gymnasium where the dance is taking place. Unfortunately for her, the doors to the dance hall are all locked. The shape then chases Joanne to the bell tower. Climbing up to the top, she finds one of Michael's victims, the janitor. She has to move his corpse in order to ring the big massive bell. This bell alerts Detective Kincaid and Gabriel, who are just arriving at the dance with the police backup. Before they can reach her, an unseen figure approaches Joanne. It's Frank her date for the night, but he soon collapses, revealing a knife in his back, and the shape stands behind him. Joanne extracts the knife and stabs her attacker in the shoulder, but the shape managed to grab a hold of Joanne's neck as he's now dangling over the bell tower. She's narrowly saved by Detective Kincaid, who shoots Michael while he falls to his death. When police investigate the area in which Michael would have fallen, they find that Michael's body is missing. Down below, though, Gabriel himself vanishes concurrent with the news of forensic evidence, which now confirms him to be the killer of the babysitter murders from the opening of the film. Police begin to search the woods nearby, encountering the shape. They open fire and hit him numerous times. He drops to the ground. Detective Kincaid approaches him to pull off the mask, but he finds Gabriel's face underneath. As Gabriel takes his last breath, the real Myers disappears into darkness. So there it is, guys. That was a story for Halloween, Two Faces of Evil. What an interesting tale that one was. So we see Michael being Michael and not being under the guise of any cult anymore. But we've also got this interesting character named Gabriel, who is this Michael Myers fanboy, as it were, who has a bad rap with the police. He's been in jail in the past for petty crimes, but he has this strong infatuation with Michael Myers. And we see now that that infatuation would lead him to start doing evil things all of his own in lieu of Myers being in prison in some weird way of continuing the legacy, as it were, of Michael, killing kids around the Halloween time. We're introduced to new characters, and some of the elements in this were actually used in Halloween 7, but we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, like the schools, these boarding-type schools and things like that, dances, except they were going to Yosemite in the film, but there were some elements in this one that sounded very familiar. And there's more detail in the book, Taking Shape 2, which I'm referencing, but yeah, Halloween Two Faces of Evil. I don't think it sounds amazing, but I also don't think it sounds that bad. It's very different compared to what we got with this film, which would be Halloween H2O, which revolves around Laurie Strode as a character. But this one not only moved on from Laurie Strode, but it also moved on from any of the characters previous. We've got new detectives in this, we've got new students becoming main actors, and we've got this strange new Gabriel character who's a big Myers fanboy who has a bad rap at the police and ends up becoming a killer all of his own. But to digress, let's talk about what happened with this Halloween Two Faces of Evil. After Zappia submitted his script, Dimension were very happy. Bob Weinstein wanted to meet with him. 
But Bob started the conversation off with, I've got good news and bad news. Bob would tell him, we love your script, but unfortunately, we will not be moving forward with it. Little did Zappia know that Jamie Lee Curtis had been plotting her own return for much of 1997. Curtis had approached Deborah Hill and John Carpenter, who both expressed interest, but Carpenter demanded a very large fee. Dimension immediately passed on Carpenter's demands. This would then lead Deborah Hill to pass as well. No John Carpenter, no Deborah Hill. Despite this though, Jamie Lee Curtis did not abandon her idea for a Halloween 20 years after the original. Adding on top of this, Scream had just become a massive success, making Kevin Williamson a big writing star. Zappia was offered to rewrite Halloween 7 for now, centering around Laurie Strode. During all of this though, Bob Weinstein was still trying to get Williamson involved. Williamson would repeatedly say no. Jamie Lee Curtis would call Williamson herself and he would buckle, like the fanboy he is, agreeing to now take part in things. He took Zappia's treatment for what was now his new Halloween 7, and penned a seven-page treatment using elements that Zappia had used prior, like the boarding schools. One thing that Williamson would ask though at the last hour is the idea of this new detective character replacing what would almost be a similar Loomis-type character in this film, making Laurie Strode the new main character of this new film. The rest is history. So poor Zappia gets involved, makes a screenplay that not only made Mustafa happy, but also the Weinsteins. It was a straight ahead horror movie with some new twists and elements, but nothing that makes Michael Myers the character some cult member or something weird. He's just out doing his thing all while this copycat, if you will, is also taking part in crimes, confusing the cops as to who's doing what. We find out in the movie, obviously, what Gabriel had been doing, but Michael is still at large in this film. It begs the question, despite the fact that this would be a straight-to-video Halloween film, would it have been bad or this low-budget thing? My money says no. I think this would have been a more highly-budgeted straight-to-video horror film, which conceivably would have been shot in great widescreen Panavision and would have been put on 4K to this day and had the only distinction of being the only straight-to-video Halloween film. But I digress. We did get Halloween H2O, which I'm a fan of. Poor Zappia. He makes a treatment that not only everybody's happy with from the start, but he gets screwed over by Jamie Lee Curtis, who now is ready to return to horror films. Now, I'm not saying Jamie Lee did anything bad, but it's interesting that when a script finally comes along that makes everybody happy, here comes old Jamie Lee. I ask you guys though, what are your thoughts on this? Halloween Two Faces of Evil. Do you think that this is a great way to move the franchise in a new direction, introducing some new characters like a new detective, having a nice twist with a copycat killer, which we all joked about with Halloween Ends, but this movie actually has a copycat killer, blurring the lines between who's doing what in the film. I don't know guys, this is something I can't wait to see what you guys think about, but this was the almost made straight to video Halloween 7, Halloween, Two Faces of Evil. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you to all of my Patreon supporters who make videos like this possible. To get behind the scenes photos, videos, music, private live streams, and more, you can subscribe to my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Thank you very much. Thank you.